we kind of have the macro and we have the micro. Uh, the macro are bigger things. They're things that we can easily see. Those include your insects, which you, uh, some people for beneficials buy those. Other people, we do conservation biocontrol. Um, but those are, you know, things like lacewings, praying mantis, wasps, things of that nature. Also, predatory mites fall into this group. Uh, a lot of, a lot of greenhouses and nurseries these days are using predatory mites. Uh, probably two of the more popular are Phytocelius persimilis, which is used to control two spots. Um, I've been working with that predatory mite since the 90s down in Florida. And then there's also uh, Cucumerus, which is being used very heavily um, for uh, spider, I mean, sorry, for uh, thrips control, especially Western flower, and also broad mites. That's where this has been used really heavily for broad mite management lately. Um, and then also nematodes fall into this category, beneficial nematodes. Um, things like Cinema feltier and Bacteria fora. Now this is obviously not a complete list, I'm just giving you an example of each. Then we also have the, the micro biocontrol agents and micro means small. And this is where microbial fungus fall into. Um, and things like Bavaria bassiana. Uh, Bavaria bassiana has been used very heavily in the industry. Um, it's in products like Botanigard, uh, Velifer, and things like that. Um, there's also Metarhizium, which is another fungus. And there's Isaria. Uh, which is another fungus. Those first three on that list are all what we call entomopathogens. That means they're fungus that kill insects, uh, and they're pretty targeted in what they do. And we're still learning a lot about them and how to use them. Um, I had mentioned before about spot and lanternfly, and Penn State's been doing um, a lot of going out and collecting in conjunction with Rutgers. They're collecting cadavers of dead spot and lantern flies. And they've actually found Bavaria bassiana is a naturally occurring fungus here uh, that has been helping to control them. So there's a lot of interest in potentially Bavaria bassiana being um, an insecticide, a product that can be used in the management. Uh, we also have, even though I'm not gonna talk about disease management, there are some um, micro beneficials like trichoderma. Uh, trichoderma is a very famous um, uh, path and uh, it's it's a fungus that eats pathogen. It actually lives on the roots. Um, it's in products like Root Shield. It was developed. Uh, the Root Shield product was developed at Cornell, but that's another beneficial fungus that's being used to manage uh, diseases. There's also bacteria. Um, now. Most times when you talk about bacteria and insect management, uh, people talk about uh, Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, which is used often to control caterpillars. That Bt is not actually the living bacteria that you're getting. You're actually getting a toxin off the bacteria. And that's why products like Dipel are so shelf stable because, um, it, it's just the toxin off the bacteria. But we do have other bacteria like Bacillus subtilis, which is being used quite heavily for disease management. So we do have insect and disease management products out there that fall into macro and micro uh, uh, categories out there. Oh, what happened? Oh, what was that? Sorry. Tried to advance and it, oh, there it is, sorry. So where is biocontrol and these kinds of products used today? So um, I work in lots of different industries. I work in hydroponics. Um, the top left image there is from a rooftop garden in New York City. Um, to the right, obviously you guys are familiar with poinsettias. Down in the lower left is uh, nursery production in Florida. This is in a shade house. Uh, this is, that picture, it was pollied over winter time. And then also I'm doing a lot with uh, hemp crops these days. But um, biocontrol is used a lot um, in multiple different industries and for quite a long time. Again, I've been doing this since uh, the 90s with biocontrol and people were doing this obviously long before I even came along. Now, one of the misconceptions is that biocontrol, you can't do it outside. Um, you know, the pictures I just all showed you were pretty much protected ag where they had some kind of structure over or around them. And 
I would say 90% of the talks I'm asked to do, probably 95, um, are on for greenhouse and protected ag. And when you talk to nursery people, um, it's like, well, you can't do beneficials outside because they'll fly away. You can't control the environment. Um, they, it won't control the pest to a satisfactory level. And one of the things that this applies to greenhouse and nursery is customers or people will not like. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions because if anything today, um, I think it's a huge marketing tool. Um, you look at companies that are promoting their beneficial use and it definitely is an advantage uh, to them that they're doing these programs. But I think um, that biocontrol can easily, easily be done outside because I, you know, as I sit here and I'm, there's a window that goes right outside here on every tree, every bush, every plant I have out there, biocontrol is happening right now on its own. And when we look for new biocontrol agents, where do we look? We go outside to find out what naturally is controlling a target pest. So biocontrol absolutely can be done outside. And if you think about it, the biocontrol agents outside are doing so much for us already. You know, they estimate in the United States that biocontrol economic value is about 57 billion dollars and so it's uh, the the plants are benefiting that much from it because so many pests are controlled already by beneficials that oftentimes we don't even know about or if we do know about um, if we can help uh, not kill them with other pesticide sprays, we can continue to do the job. We get the financial benefit from that. So they're a very important part of our industry. And it's really nice over my career to see this swing because definitely in the 90s, everybody was about killing everything on every plant. And now people are taking the time to see what's good, what's bad, and um, making better decisions on that. So basically, when you look at the different kinds of biocontrol, there's three categories. There's classical, augmentative, and then what I call conservation, but it's easier to explain is just mother nature taking over. Classical biocontrol is something we as an industry really aren't involved in. Um, this is uh, more federal programs, projects the USDA works on. Uh, like right now, they're looking at potential uh, predators and parasites for the uh, spotted lanternfly, they've done the same thing with the brown marmoted stink bug where they looked for egg parasites. Um, they did programs with hydrilla in Florida with weevils. So they do mass releases of biocontrol agents that are very targeted for a specific pest and hoping to suppress it or eradicate it. Um, these programs takes years and years and years and years and a lot of research because you can't just oh, let's go to another country, bring a beneficial in and let it go and see what happens. It's a very complex um, uh, program. Uh, they have to look again to make sure those beneficials they're going to release aren't going to move over onto different beneficial, uh, onto different pests or other native uh, insects. And so it's well studied and it's, it, it doesn't happen often today that they do get these release programs because there's so much involved. Now, what I work on more of on a daily basis is augmentative biocontrol. This is basically where you buy bat bugs and you release them. Um, pretty much we treat the biocontrol agents almost like a pesticide in this sense. It's not, oh, you release bugs, they've established and you don't have to release again. People release biocontrol agents like they were spraying. Instead of spraying every week, they're releasing beneficials, let's say, every two weeks. It depends on the crop, target pests, but they're just out there perpetually releasing, keeping those beneficial numbers really high um, in the crop to maintain the pest. The reality is 99% of these beneficials end up starving to death because we often don't have enough pests uh, to feed them, and that's kind of what you want because you want a clean crop. Now, where you get these beneficials, there are several large insectaries, and I will say these are the, the key players, uh, probably for most of our growers these days. There's a few smaller specialty insectaries around, but these are, these are the, I call them the Coke and Pepsis of the world um, that are providing beneficials to uh, the different greenhouses, nurseries, um, and different companies. Now, when, you're going to go this route. And, you know, I could spend a 
days just focusing on how to do augmented biocontrol, but a couple things. You need to make sure you can find somebody that can work with you closely and that they're qualified. Um, there has definitely been a, a, a gold rush in the biocontrol industry over the last few years um, because the demand has escalated and so everyone has decided to jump on board and sell beneficials. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you can provide the technical information because there is a level of expertise and knowledge that needs to go along with them. So if you are selecting somebody to work with, I always say just ask them, why are you qualified to help me? Um, and that way you make sure you get the best information possible because I do a lot of vetting of programs that have been written for growers and I see a lot of mistakes made in them and, and very costly mistakes. So make sure you find people that are qualified. Also make sure your pest is identified correctly. Because if you're releasing a biocontrol agent and it's not gonna work on your pest, you're just wasting money doing that. Um, pest identification can be tricky, um, but you know, with the internet and all the amazing digital microscopes that you can attach to your uh, computer and phone, everybody knows I'm absolutely obsessed with Dynalites. It's, um, Macro, it's, a, it's a digital microscope you can hold in your hand. It almost looks like an ultrasound probe. And you can take some pretty detailed pictures um, of insects. And you could send them to me. You can send them to your extension agent. You can send them to, uh, you can send them to Mindy. Mindy will help you out. Um, and uh, that way they can make sure you're, you're targeting the right pest. Also, when you're working with somebody, make sure if one of the things that should qualify them is they should ask you for the last two months of your spray records because we do know that some of the pesticides actually can um, persist on the plant for two months and still have impact on beneficials. That doesn't mean the pesticides are still out there killing your pest problem, but they definitely can have impacts on beneficials uh, for at least two months, some of them. So that's why we have to look at those spray records. The other thing, is it going to be economical? There are some programs um, that are definitely economical to do. Um, I found down in Florida, let's say for spider mites, um, moving to a biocontrol program for spider mites has been economical for a lot of growers. When I moved from Florida to the north and people talked about, oh, well, we're only having to spray for fighter, spider mites, you know, four or five times a year, it may not be economical then to move to a biocontrol program um, because if you're only spraying, let's say, five times a year, that's going to be less than releasing a lot of beneficials. In Florida, where you're spraying, let's say, one, possibly sometimes twice a week, using the beneficials can be more economical. So you have to look beyond just the actual cost of the bugs and the actual cost of the chemistry. You have to look at the frequency of application. Um, you also have to keep in mind that uh, shipping costs can be high on these things because they do come overnighted. But the other thing you have to look at is the cost of labor of applying them. Um, and that's why there's been a lot of, um, of of what's the word I'm looking for, advancements in uh, biocontrol application. The two pictures I have here on the bottom left, that's actually a drone uh, from the company Parabug, and they have uh, franchisee companies around the United States. In fact, I just talked to their Florida rep last week, and they take these drones and they put things like predatory mites, lacewings, parasitoids in them, and then they'll fly out over crops and release them to save on labor costs. On the right, we have a blower uh, that this design's been around for several years now, probably 20 plus years. Um, and instead of having to hand sprinkle bugs, this way they can blow their predatory mites out into their crops at a very cost effective rate. Um, so we've found ways to really help with the cost of application of bugs because again, you have to look at labor costs, the cost of the input product, and then shipping when you're looking at the economics of, a, of an augmented biocontrol program. Now, the last kind of biocontrol, which we're going to focus a little bit more on, um, is conservation of your local beneficials. And I, I put including pollinators in there because there's such focus on uh, pollinator conservation these days and helping the beneficials that that when you are helping your 
predatory mites and your native beneficials, you end up helping the pollinators. And actually a lot of the beneficials are actually pollinators themselves. So there's a, there's a crossover there. Now, with these kinds of programs, we really focus on ID and we really have to see what's out there. And when you don't have exclusion, you can get a lot of beneficials moving in. And then when we do need to treat for a, for a problem, we are very selective about the products we use. And we try to find products that are have minimal impacts on the beneficials that are there. And we also work at focusing on thresholds. If we find just one spider mite, is it worth going in and, and doing some kind of treatment for, or do we want to scout in, let's say, you know, three days and see where we're at? So we really look at all these kinds of things and trying to put um, a program together where we can help preserve the natives we do have. Now, currently, um, people outside are doing, um, and this is kind of a hybrid program here. Uh, this is an image from Metrolina Greenhouses. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't been there much this year because of COVID. I've been pretty much home the last five months, but I'm hoping uh, to get going traveling again here soon. Um, this program is a hybrid because what you're seeing here are banker plants, which are those purple plants, those pepper plants, which they were preceded with beneficials. And the idea is that you move the plants out and then those beneficials they inoculated the plants with can move to the mum crop and back and forth. Part of what is happening here, though, is native beneficials have moved in to take advantage of the pollen and nectar in those pepper plants. So it's not only working as a banker plant to help feed the beneficials they released, they're also helping to feed their native beneficials. Um, this is how the setup was a couple years ago, and things have, have changed a little bit now. We've made islands and we've added more plants in. And so they actually have their beneficial insect uh, garden where they plant an assortment of plants in blocks, again, to feed their native beneficials and attract them in, but also um, feed the beneficials that they've bought and released. And so you can see how they've done these islands here. And when we go out and scout them, um, you know, we find, you know, Again, things we've released and things that have moved in on their own. And this has actually been working very well um, for their program out there. And let me tell you too, these are pretty oppressive conditions for insects to survive in. You know, having acres and acres of cement pads in North Carolina, it's, it's pretty toasty out there. And um, I'm very pleased to see how well this program has been working. Other things people are doing now, this is a bit more of a landscape setting. This is actually Bouchard Gardens up in British Columbia. Um, and we know alyssum is excellent, excellent for feeding many beneficials, especially aureus, the minute pirate bug. We do have to watch in the south because of the temperatures, um, because sometimes alyssum can't handle the heat as well. Um, but it still can be an excellent uh, pollen nectar resource for again, things like aureus and things like surfeit flies. Um, aureus, the minute pirate bug, likes to feed on things like thrips, and it also likes to feed on spider mites. And in this setup, you can see they have roses and roses get hammered by thrips and spider mites. So this way we're encouraging those aureus to stay there um, and, and feed and uh, reproduce to help with the pest issues. Here's just another shot of that alyssum growing underneath the roses. And I actually got down here and climbed through a bunch of this, and I actually did find uh, aureus down in there. So it was pretty exciting. It's always nice to see, you know, what you're preaching actually is working in practice. So when you are out there scouting, who stays and goes? And this is something um, I get email. I, I get emails and I get a lot of uh, messages through Instagram every day asking to identify things. Um, and I get these pictures and, you know, is it a pest problem? Um, sometimes the, if it is a pest, it may already be dead. And, you know, the question is, is do I need to treat for this? Should it stay or should it go? So identification is really, really critical on this. This is an example. I actually got this photo this past week um, because they were concerned about these caterpillars eating their crop. 
And, and this is not the first time I've had this questions. And I actually had a hydrangea grower um, that had these caterpillars uh, eating their plants and they went in and they sprayed for them. And the problem is, is this is not a caterpillar. This is actually a predatory fly larva called a surfid fly. Um, and what do they do? They feed on aphids. They're not going to do any damage to your plants. They're beneficial and we want them around. And we actually plant a lot of flowering plants to attract in the adults, um, which are also called hoverflies, flowerflies. And they have that weird kind of flight pattern where they hover and then they'll lay their eggs and their eggs look like tiny grains of rice and the eggs hatch and these little, um, they're actually maggots because they are fly larvae, but uh, they can be brown or they can be green. We'll feed on your aphids. And this is why identification is so important because these guys are working for you for free. And so you wouldn't want to come in and spray something that was going to impact them. Now, let's say you did have caterpillars in addition to these. Well, if you selected a product like BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, that's targeted just for caterpillars, you could spray that. It won't hurt your serpent flies, but it would help control your caterpillars. So we do know, not in all situations, but a lot of situations where we can go in and cherry pick a pest out with a very targeted pesticide these days. So ID is really critical. I can't say it enough. If you need help with identification, um, there's not a book that I would say is the be all end all is gonna have all your answers. But these are two books I recommend for a lot of people to have, especially if you're doing outdoor production, because both of these books have a lot of pictures of things you're just gonna find um, all throughout the United States. Uh, the top left book, The Natural Enemies Handbook, this focuses on beneficials. And what's important is it focuses on beneficials in all their life stages. So you can see their entire life cycle because you know, a lot of people recognize surfeit and flower flies, the adults, but they may not recognize the larva. And so that's why it's important to know what every life stage looks like. And then in the lower right, Whitney Cranshaw um, put this book together and he basically had entomologists from all over the country send pictures in. Um, and so it's a pretty good Bible of insects you're just gonna find outside. It's not targeted for commercial production, but it's got some really good pictures of, of uh, of the pests and beneficials and guys that are absolutely harmless who don't need to die who are just hanging out in the, the book so i recommend those now i do have and i just um rebuilt and basically gave my website a complete facelift last week um and this is from um, my new relaunched website um, um, I have a book list on there and I have a lot of these different books listed on there that um, some of them are free PDFs you can download on, on um, IPM, insect identification, biocontrol, things like that. And other ones are links that are going to take you to either Amazon or ABE or wherever you can buy the books. But if you're looking for some resource books, the, this I have a whole list on this page on my website that can... Um, uh, get you information uh, that will help you with your programs. Now, the good guys. Um, again, we owe them because for decades we've been killing them innocently because, you know, they're out there just trying to help you out and, you know, you come by with broad spectrum products like bifenthrin or orthene and it just kills everything. So we want to try to help them and encourage them and we can totally do this today. We've learned so much. And there's actually quite a bit of research out there that, that has proven we can help support them. Um, this here is a Uwanimus scale. Um, I actually took this down in North Carolina in Hendersonville. And Uwanimus scale has been a real issue. Um, so uh, there's several good entomologists that have been working on this. Cliff Sadoff, he's out at Purdue. Um, and uh, if you ever get to hear him present on this, it's very interesting because basically what they did is they took euonymus and infected it with the euonymus scale. And then they would take these particular plants here and then they would bring them around them. And so here's kind of the setup where they had euonymus with low flower, high flower around it and different um, 
different up in the top left, a different assortment of how they were positioned. And basically they wanted to see if, if you have biodiversity, do you get more beneficials? And I mean, that's basically what they found. And, and what's nice is people have been saying it for years, but to have research to back it up um, and natural enemies in general, spires and parasitic wasps specifically, were usually most abundant in euonymus beds surrounded by flowering plants. And the reason the parasitic wasps are so important is because there is a parasitoid that controls euonymus scale and that's what you want to have come show up. Um, and what they did find too is that you know these beneficials would disperse around and that there's been this whole discussion too is it is it the flowers or is it biodiversity and it's starting to point to that it's just biodiversity that is um bringing these beneficials in yes you do want some floral resources but sometimes you can just have different types of plants around and it can bring them in there was another uh research project uh, that was done at the university of illinois and basically they looked at some woody scotch pine and uh a winter greens and it, in this case again another euonymus and so what they did is they went out and placed them in turf which you know we often see in parking lots and then they put mulch around them and they infested them with scales and then they looked at you know clover goldenrod spurge and a coreopsis and then they took a third of the plants and then they didn't provide any of these floral resources and the same thing happened here that the plants where you had those like the coreopsis and those planted around you had 10 times uh, more beneficial insects in those areas. And they actually found that the mortality of the scales were twice on where you had those insectary plants around. Um, and this is what's been interesting in that theory they're talking about that it's not always about the blooms, it's about biodiversity. They actually removed the blooms and they actually found higher levels of beneficials. I don't understand why they had higher levels, but I think too sometimes um, what people don't know, I think a lot of you people know because you're in the horticulture industry, is a lot of plants do have what we call extra floral nectaries. Um, and those are places on the plant, uh, beneficials can get pollen and nectar that are, I'm sorry, nectar that are not necessarily in the bloom. Um, it, probably who has the best and showiest ones are passion vines, I actually grew a passion vine this year just, to, to, just for the extra floral nectaries. Um, but those are, play, those are, again, they're basically like little feeding stations and little balls of sugar water form on them that the beneficials can come feed on. Um, it's a whole interesting subject to read about, but that's something that even though sometimes you don't have blooms present, there is basically sugar water nectar available for some of these beneficials. But the focus of a lot of this is, has been showing that just biodiversity uh, can help bring in beneficials to help uh, manage a lot of pest issues. Now, Paula Shrewsbury down at the University of Maryland, if you've not followed her work, um, and I, I'm not going to go a lot into depth in all of this, but basically, in a nutshell, she found out what everybody else has found, is that if you um, plant a uh, biodiversity out that it will bring in the beneficials and then it will help control in this situation they were looking at azalea lace bug and she has a paper uh, specifically talking about just textural differences in plants and different heights and about attracting in beneficials um, so that's some very interesting information also this is just another completely different side note about dandelions in lawns because i love my dandelions but you know, these guys all got together and looked at uh, dandelions and white clover and lawns. And interestingly enough, from dandelions and clover, they collected 50 different species of insect pollinators. And the surfid flies we talked about before, remember the larvae are predatory and like to feed on aphids and other soft-bodied insects. The adults are pollinators. So by having things like dandelions and clover around, we can help feed them, especially early in the spring, because that's some of the earliest spring pollen out there. Um, unfortunately, we as a society have been busy trying to kill them because we've been told they're bad, but they're actually a really, really good resource for our pollinators out there. Now, 
the take home message here is biodiversity attracts beneficials. And what is a challenge in the type of facilities I work in and that you guys all work in is we do massive monocultures and that makes it very difficult. But that picture I showed you before of Metro, they're finding a way to try to break up their monocultures by providing these islands. If you, if you go out to California and go through some of their organic uh, produce farms, you'll see you'll have lines and lines and lines of produce, but then you'll see a strip of alyssum planted through. And we're starting to see more of that where people are breaking up these massive monocultures of ags. Um, by providing these pollen nectar resources for beneficials and just breaking up the monocultures. So it's something to think about. Um, you know, we can't completely change how we grow. It doesn't make sense to mix all your plants up out there, but it may be something to think about when you are thinking about the layout of your production facility. Is there a way at our facility to, um, you know, plant a strip? of these plants or have containerized plants that we can move around to feed our beneficials, especially if we're doing a lot of, of woody kind of shrubs, which may not offer pollen and nectar resources. Now, people do ask often about what plants to use. And one of my biggest pet peeves in life um, is marigolds because everyone's like, oh, you want, you know, marigolds, they're a miracle for thing. Plant them in your garden. You know, they attract beneficials, but they repel pests, which I, you know, does not compute, does not compute in my brain to make comments like that. Um, and it can be challenging, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when you're like looking for information on planting plants for beneficials, uh, I don't even know who made some of these early lists up and they would just be like, you know, impatience, petunias, plants that we know really aren't offering any uh, floral resources. One of the things I look at is uh, flower structure. And this is something Penn State has been doing a lot of great work on looking at plants and what do they attract. Um, I know that a lot of you are in uh, a different growing region, so what Penn State's doing does not necessarily apply, but I'm really hoping what Penn State's been doing with their trial garden research can be repeated in warmer climates with different plant material. And basically what they did is they planted out dozens and dozens of different plants that have potential to be attractive for pollinators, uh, predators, butterflies and things like that. And then they got master gardeners to sit at those plants and observe what came to them. And it's very interesting. And, and basically Penn State then took all that information and combined it into lists. And they basically said, okay, out of all these plants, here are the top 10 butterfly plants. Here are the top, you know, honeybee plants. Here are the top, you know, uh, beneficial plants. And they broke down lists by visual observations. And, you know, it's interesting because flower structure was playing a critical role in this. And what they found is when you have these really tight, tight flowers like the top left, and I'm picking on roses, but just roses are a good example. Um, the beneficials have a really hard time getting down into the pollen nectar. And same thing with the pollinators. But when you have much more open flowers, it's easier for them to get into there. Um, and I, I realized that consumers like those really, really petaled flowers because they're big and showy, but sometimes just a simple flower is what we need uh, to provide the resources for our pollinators and our beneficials. So when you are thinking about selecting plants, because again, in the South, we have to take heat into consideration. Um, because, uh, you know, we, again, a lot of this trial work has been done in more temperate climates. We have to make sure that they can ha handle the heat of, of the South. And this is something that even you can do at your own facility. I've been doing it in my yard here, you know, maybe pick five plants, plant them out, and just take a few minutes, you know, each day to walk by and, and see what's visiting them to see if they could potentially be a good pollen and resource plant for you. Something that's interesting too is they've actually been looking at the differences between cultivar because sometimes just saying planting alyssum may not be good enough or just planting um, monardia is, is, isn't good enough. And, and this is some interesting work too that's been done where the actual cultivars are seeing differences in attractive for pollinators. So um, you do have to pay attention to this because 
the plant breeders, and again, I'm not picking on plant breeders, but you know, the plants are being bred for human characteristics. What has the height we want? What, what has the bloom humans want? What is disease resistant? What is insect resistant? Not, hey, let's breed these to feed our beneficials. And so in some of these plants, they basically bred out um, the food resources that the beneficials need. So you do have to pay attention. And that's why I, here on my property, I've got seven acres here. I actually look at a lot of old heirloom varieties of plants that haven't been tinkered with too much on the genetics. And um, they're pretty simple flowers in a way. They're very open. Um, and those I found have been very good um, for bringing in a lot of beneficials. Uh, something I planted a fair amount of around is um, a mountain mint. It's a pignanthium species. And let me tell you, uh, when it comes to attracting decanted flies, I'm starting to think there's nothing better. Decanted flies themselves are pollinators and they're really ugly, hairy flies, but they lay eggs on things like stink bugs and caterpillars and things like that. And their larvae are the meat eaters. So it's uh, beneficial to have as many tachanids around. If you don't know about tachanids, just Google tachanids and um, just read a little bit about them so you're aware of them. So oftentimes though, if we are doing a program, you planted all these beneficials out, you're trying to attract the ones in and whoops, we still end up with a pest problem. So first of all, um, we have to make sure we identify really what the pest is. Is it really a problem? Are there beneficials present? You know, and if, as, are the beneficials present going to be able to control it? Because if I find an outbreak of, let's say, aphids, and then I'm in there scouting, and then I mentioned before about surfer flies, the flower flies, and how their eggs look like little grains of rice. If I see a pocket of aphids, but then I see those little grains of rice around, I may say to the grower, okay, don't spray yet. Give it a few days and come back and check again because those eggs are going to hatch and those surfer flies are going to start feeding. Same thing with predatory mites. If you're out there, we find some uh, spider mite issues, but we find predatory mite eggs laid within the pest mite population. It may be like, okay, give it a few days, monitor, let's see what happens um, so, because those predatory mite eggs are going to hatch and then they're going to start feeding and they may be able to get the problem under control for you. Problem is, is we often, and I would say with good reason, are so fast to jump in to spray that we don't give the beneficials a chance to work because there's an expectation of an absolutely perfect product that we, when we sell it, which we need to have that perfect product. But sometimes the beneficials can control a problem for you. But if we do need to spray, we have to select a pesticides that compatible. And I'll tell you, the newer chemistries are so much smarter and are so much more targeted than the old school products. But a lot of times we get caught in the loop of using the old school products um, because we're familiar with them and they're inexpensive. Um, on the programs. So there are um, a lot of different places you can look at pesticide compatibility to see if your products are, um, I'm sorry, if the spray products and what their impact is going to be on, uh, on the beneficials out there. Do we have compatibility information for every pesticide and every beneficial? No, but <clears throat> For the majority of the commercially produced biocontrol agents, we do have information. And I will say the pesticide companies are now providing more pesticide beneficial compatibility information, if you ask, because they are including it in their trials and testing these days. Um, most of this information, uh, the mobile app from AgroBio, BioBest, and Copert, um, those are all free to use. Um, you do have to pay for the one from IOBC, that's $100 a year, but if you're interested in learning about biocontrol, the IOBC, it's the International Organization of Biocontrol, has a ton of information on their website, and it is well worth $100 a year membership um, to uh, the group that works on pesticide compatibility, and they probably have the most comprehensive database of beneficials and uh, pesticide compatibility information out there. Um, that's available. 
This is the IOBC website. This is again for the chapter that works on uh, the pesticide compatibility. And uh, you can go in and you can put in, and I know this isn't a great graphic because there's just so much information, but you can put in the active ingredient, you can put in the biocontrol information. And what this gives you that the other free apps don't give you is it gives you more specifics on you know, the rates, who did the research, and even on some of the microbials now, it's breaking them down by strain. So it gives you a much more extensive database. Is this for everybody? No. If you are really into um, using a lot of bios and biocontrol conservation, yes, this might be something you would be very interested in. So let's pretend you have your facility and you're doing your thing and all of a sudden, poof, you have an aphid problem. Okay, what are we gonna do? So, first of all, we're gonna go out and scout. And let's say we're scouting and like, oh look, we have lots of ladybird beetle larvae. And that's exactly, I just took this picture on Thursday at a facility. Um, we were looking at some aphids and boom, here are the lacewing larvae, I mean the ladybird larvae climbing around. So you've got aphids, and you've also got ladybugs, and you have to make that decision on what are we gonna do. Well, if let's say you're shipping in a few days, there is not really time to wait for the ladybugs to catch up. Or if you feel you don't have enough ladybird larda out there, you may need to come in and spray. And that's where you can go into these um, websites and uh, you can look about how uh, pesticides impact beneficials. In this situation, um, I put in coleoptera, and, and it's a little scary because coleoptera is a little generic because that's, that's a lot of different beetles out there, but it gives us um, a basic idea of how pirate pie, metrazine is going to impact them. And what this is telling us here is that if you've got adults cruising around, it's not going to do anything to them. Um, I don't say anything. You know, water blasts can knock them off, and it's possible you can kill some of them, but it's generally considered pretty safe. But if you have larvae present, you're probably going to kill some of them, you know, 25 to 50 percent maybe. So you're going to have some impact on them. But again, if you need to ship or you have too many aphids, you're going to need to do something. So this might be a good option to come in to knock them back with having less of an impact on your beneficials. Now, there's another product on the market now, Vintegra, um, and the Vintegra hasn't made it into all the apps yet, but if you contact BSF, they do have compatibility information. And if you go down here, they do have, they've done testing with lady beetles, um, some species of them, and they have found these to be very compatible with it. So Vintegra is another option that you could come in, knock back the aphids, but have minimal to almost no impact on the ladybirds. So this way, you get the benefits of both. You get the benefit of the pesticide and your native ladybird that's working for you. If you were to come in, let's say with something like orthene, you know, that is going to annihilate your ladybird population. That will definitely kill them. And now you've lost that free tool in your tool shed working for you. So again, there's some really good products out there that can go in and cherry pick because Vintegra is very targeted um, with what it works on. It works with the piercing sucking insects, things like aphids and white flies. So they can be targeted in how they work. Now, something I, else I want to point out here is imetoclopred is something that's been used. I know most people ha are phasing it out now um, because of phasing out neonics, but I just want to point this out, is that how you apply a pesticide too can make a difference. And this is very interesting because if you look at a metoclopred here, which is systemic, and if you look at these different predators on the left, you have Amblyseus californicus, which is a predatory mite that feeds in spider mites. You have Chrysopa, which is, uh, that's a green lacewing. And then you have Aureus, which is the pi minute pirate bug. When it is applied as an S, S means spray. And when you have this red number four, pretty much means you've nuked them dead, done. They're out of there, that's it. But interestingly, an I means irrigation. 
And so if you irrigate a metacloprid, applied as a drench, it has almost no impact on Californicus. If you, again, applied as a drench, it has almost no impact on lacewing. What's interesting though, and this is where knowing your beneficials really helps, is aureus, this minute pirate bug, it is an omnivore. It not only feeds on thrips and spider mites, it will also drink juices out of the plants. A metacloprid is a systemic. So when this aureus goes to take a sip out of your plant, even as a systemic, it's being killed and is persistent for at least six weeks in the plants. So again, when, when you're selecting a pesticide, not only do you have to look at the active, you have to think about the application method because different application methods can make a difference. And this is one of these advantages now, um, kind of flipping over to talk about augmentative biocontrol is you're probably starting to see more and more sachets being used in commercial production. The advantage of using a sachet over loose product is if you have your predatory mites in these slow release sachets, and let's say you do need to come through and spray um, a softer pesticide, the breeding colony of those predatory mites is protected in that paper sachet. So let's just say you're gonna come through and spray an oil. So if you come through and spray an oil, it's non-selective. It's gonna kill your beneficials and pests on your plant, but it's not gonna kill the breeding colony inside of the sachet because it's protected in there. And so the next day, more predators are gonna start coming out again and get reintroduced right back into the crop. If you were just releasing loose predatory mites, you don't get that immediate reintroduction. Um, and so this is where sachets have been really good. The sachet actually protects the breeding colony of predatory mites in there when you do have to come through and spray. So let's talk about if you have a two spot, because a two spot problem, because I will say this year, um, this is probably what I've gotten the most inquiries about in an early spring before I, you know, got sent back home. Um, spider mites were what I was seeing a lot of. And yes, this is really bad spider mites. When you have mites this bad, I'm not going to be able to magically fix that for you. That's, that's bad. But let's say you were releasing the predatory mite persimilis um, and you're putting it out there. But for some reason, your spider mite numbers are still going up. Um, and what do you do? Um, because you you have invested in spending money on releasing persimilis and uh, the crop I was actually in um, this last Thursday, they hadn't released persimilis in over two weeks um, and they had had a spider mite population out there. We were still finding quite a few persimilis out in the crop, which was kind of exciting to see, but if you were uncomfortable with the number of two spots or you were very close to shipping or again your two spot numbers are going up and you're just not seeing as many persimilis you may need to come in and treat well you got to think about what product you can come in and treat with so here's one option horticultural oils have been phenomenal for spider mite management um so and i'm focusing here just on mineral oils i'm not talking about rosemary oil or other botanical oils the disadvantage to it is it kills beneficials. Oils are non-selective. If you're good or bad, mite comes in contact, it's going to kill you. But an advantage is, is that oils can kill all life stages of the two-spot spider mite, egg, immature, and adult. Once it's dry, you can re-release your beneficials in there. It's also economical to use and you have a very short REI. But sometimes people get a little nervous about using oils, even though we're way smarter about using oils today. Um, and you know, if you do everything right, you can use oils. But in July, you know, in the middle of the day, would I go spray an oil? No. Um, you know, you have to use common sense about this. But let's just say you can't or don't want to use oils. Well, here's another option. Um, there is um, another uh, miticide out there. It's called Sultan. Now, a disadvantage to this is this is going to have a longer REI of 12 hours. And I, I say it expensive, but don't yell at me. I put the little asterisks because expensive is relative. Um, you know, I, I've known people to use Avid um, and there are resistance issues uh, with Avid these days. We do know that, but they'll spray it again and they'll spray it again and they'll spray it again, but it didn't work. And I've seen people spray pesticide products that didn't work over and over and over again. 
if you did four or five sprays of a product that wasn't working, it's a lot less expensive to come in and spray one time with a newer chemistry that we know is working. Um, and so um, Sultan has been very good about this with our predatory mite programs. Um, because we can be doing a predatory mite program with like Persimilis and we want to get a knockback on the spider mites, we can come in, do a spray with Sultan, and then continue on with our Persimilis program and it will preserve the Persimilis we have there and then we can immediately start releasing more Persimilis. So it gives us a good way to knock back some of the two spots and allow the beneficials to keep working for us there. Another option is using a product like a Fluoramite, but I put this little chart in here. If you look with the fluoramite, what's interesting is not all predatory mites are the same. Because if you look, the predatory mite Californicus as a spray, it's very compatible and considered safe. But fluoramite with Persimilis, it actually, if you spray it, you really need to wait about a week before you reintroduce. And you can, you can knock back your Persimilis population somewhat there. So you do have to be very meticulous about which miticides on which predatory mites and which insecticides on which beneficials because just saying safe with beneficials is not good enough. Just saying safe with predatory mites isn't good enough. You have to know which predatory mite. So it's very important to pay close, closely, you gotta focus on these details. Now, I know this is a lot of information and a lot of like, well, how do I keep up with all this? Back to when I talked earlier about when you want to use beneficials, have a beneficial buddy, somebody that's proficient in it. So you can just say, call them and say, hey, you know, we're using your Persimilis, but we need to do a knockback. What can I use? And those people should be able to provide you the information about the compatibility so you don't have to do all this homework. Um, Again, this information is readily available, but sometimes you just want the answer and don't want to have to research it all. And again, that's what the insectaries should be able to provide for you. And again, I'm seeing a lot more of the uh, chemical reps are very knowledgeable about compatibility with beneficials. So hey, there are- Suzanne, I've got yeah. a quick one. Um, we have yeah. one question and it says IGR like Tetrasan. It depends on which predatory mite, but that's considered softer on the spectrum. Um, okay. It's not what, it, it's something that can be used inside of a predatory mite program. It's not gonna blow you out of the water like bifenthrin's gonna do for two months. Okay, thank so, you, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, scared me a little. I was a loud booming voice. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, that's fine. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. I like doing that because those are things people uh, need to know. So. Anyhow, so, you know, I want people to realize, and this is something because I have been accused of being a pesticide hater in the industry and that I'm anti-pesticide. And anybody that knows me knows that's not true. I don't really have any growers I'm working with, with the exception, I will say, some of the medical cannabis facilities that are doing 100% biocontrol. Most greenhouses and nurseries, it's a combo program of beneficials with the sprays. We have to... We have to use it all, all the tools we have. You're a fool to say, I'm only going to be a pesticide person or I'm only going to be bios. You've got to utilize all the tools we have available today. And there is so much information on this compatibility stuff now that we can put these programs together and use, use pull the best from every industry out there to be able to use. So that's it. There's my, I went one minute over, 1201.